Continuamos con la participación de Grand Mensis de la firma The City of Play, una premiada empresa social de arquitectura que ayuda a las comunidades a crear lugares de juego inclusivos y atractivos en Escocia. Arquitectura para la infancia es la manera de facilitar el juego libre y atraer a los niños con sus ambientes construidos y naturales. Emplean una filosofía de diseño lúdico con el arte público, el paisaje, la arquitectura y el diseño urbano, a través de procesos participativos, capacitación de las comunidades y el deber del ciudadano. Damos la bienvenida a Grand Mencius. Welcome to Mexico City and a este simposio del papalote Niños y Niñas por el Derecho a la Ciudad. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por invitarme a la, a la Ciudad de México. <laughs> My name is Grant Menzies. I'm a father of four and I'm a co-founder and director at the City of Play, where our business is architecture for childhood, delivering the social, health, educational and economic benefits of play through design. My interest in childhood and the city began at university, where I tried to balance fatherhood and my education in architecture. In the beginning, I didn't think that this would be significant. However, I found that play is a vital component in the healthy development of our children and in turn our cities and culture. But through ignorance or otherwise, as a whole, design has been getting it wrong for so many years. And my practice was set up to change that. My recent research titled Playful and Playful Cities aims to build upon my range of work to date and establish what we can do as those responsible for the planned change of our environment to promote more inclusive and healthy interaction with our cities. So if we accept that there's more to life than existence, work and everyday functioning, and we acknowledge the role playing has in our development as individuals and society, then we must recognize that the well-functioning city must be at once playful and playful. Playful in the sense that it provides an array of opportunities and opportunities for all, and playful in the sense that our public spaces are inviting, challenging, and creatively engaging. Our vision is to enrich communities or cities through play using a triad of innovative design, play intelligence, and collaborative practice. The topic of my presentation today are the ill-considered rights of the child in urban design and how we better facilitate their needs and activity in the city. Article 31 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child states that every child has the right to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child and to participate freely in cultural life and the arts. Member governments shall respect and promote the right of the child to participate fully in cultural and artistic life and shall encourage the provision of appropriate and equal opportunities for cultural, artistic, recreational and leisure activity. Because as Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck once said, if cities are not meant for children, they are not meant for citizens either. If they're not meant for citizens ourselves, they are not cities. Sorry. I would like to speak to you about the importance of play in childhood and society and better define what I mean by play, our experience of the decline in free play in the UK and Europe, in the assumption that there is a direct correlation with the trends in the Americas, and explore ideas for the integration of play and making urban space more child friendly. Without play, life would be dull. Even as an adult, I cannot imagine life without the opportunity to let go engage my imagination and just have a bit of fun. Besides the obvious benefit of making life just that little bit more enjoyable and interesting, our studies found that play is in fact a necessity in life with a vast range of benefits. An established and ever-growing international evidence research has, has demonstrated the great value of play, particularly to young children, confirming generally accepted claim, claims that play gives children the freedom to act independently, promotes social interaction and socialization, facilitates cognitive development. Through phys physical activity, it promotes healthier lifestyles and healthy bodies, facilitates creative thinking and problem solving, promotes emotional well-being be well and facilitates self-discovery. So play is a process that is freely chosen, personally directed and intrinsically motivated. That is, 
children and young people control the content and intent of their play by following their own instincts, ideas and interests in their own way for their own reasons. And ideally, much of play involves adults, but when play is controlled by adults, children have to adhere to their rules and as a result, lose some of the benefits play offers them, particularly in developing creativity, leadership skills, group skills. Therefore, we differentiate free play from more structured activities such as organized sports, games, or classes. And much like sport, encouraging unstructured play is an exceptional way to increase physical activity levels in children, which is one important strategy in tackling recent trends in childhood obesity. It's through play that children at a very early age engage and interact in the world around them. Play allows children to create and explore a world that they can master conquering their fears while practicing adult roles. As they master their world, play helps children develop new competencies that lead to enhanced confidence and the resiliency they need to face future challenges. Undirected play allows children to learn how to work in groups, to share, to negotiate, to resolve conflicts, and to learn self-advocacy skills. When play is allowed to be child-driven, children practice decision-making skills, move at their own pace, discover their own areas of interest, and ultimately engage fully in the passions that they wish to pursue. All of these activities and skills prepare us for adulthood where we continue to play, to figure things out, to invent. Throughout our entire history, we have played and civilization has de developed. Law and order, commerce and profit, craft and art, poetry, wisdom and science have all arisen through and as a result of play. And it's imperative that we allow this progress to continue through supporting ch children in play-based learning. In the Mirai Kan, which is the Japanese Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, they ask the questions, what kind of adults do you want our children to be? So for example, in 2050, when our children are adults, global warming will be progressing and the estimated global population will be 9.5 billion. In that time, torrential rains, droughts, natural disasters and the shortage of food, water, water and energy that we're already beginning to experience will become more and more serious. To survive such a future, what kinds of skills should our children learn? And what can adults do for children? Now there's more than one answer, but their stance is the same as ours. These skills can't be taught in books or formal learning, but they can be developed through play. Kids need space to play, to be creative, to experiment, to take risks, to learn to problem solve, and perhaps above all, explore their imagination. The use of their imagination helps children develop a cognitive skill called executive function. Now, executive function has a number of different elements, but a central one is the ability to self-regulate. So kids with good self-regulation are able to control their emotions and behavior, resist impulses, and exert self-control and discipline. Poor executive function is actually associated with high dropout rates, drug use, antisocial behavior, and crime. Whereas good executive function is actually a better predictor of academic success than a child's IQ, because if you're better able to manage your feelings and tension, you're much better equipped to learn. And what this means, for example, is that in the poorest neighborhoods where children face the most barriers to play, children can become trapped in a cycle of poverty, ill health, low educational achievement, crime, and unemployment. Now, a child's imagination can be encouraged in a number of ways, through reading books and stories, playing with creative toys or objects such as Play-Doh or blocks, through painting or drawing, playing with dolls, or through sand or water play, where children imagine different scenarios or characters and play them out for extended periods of time. But the everyday physical environment of a child is also open to the interpretive skills of their imagination. In terms of fostering imagination, the best of these don't plant the, a specific idea or imaginative scenario. So for example, in a playground, a play apparatus may resemble a pirate ship. But what this does is serve up a, a predetermined script, thereby inhibiting the scope of a child's imagination. It's preferable that a play environment be open to the interpretation of the individual, allowing for a broad range of imaginative scenarios where children can explore their own, own ideas and interests. So if you think about the cardboard box, everyone knows that on Christmas or birthdays, children would rather play with the box than the toy. 
Um, this is because once they're finished playing with the toy car, for example, it's still a toy car. Whereas a box can be anything they want it to be. Likewise, a stick is not just a stick, but a gun, a lightsaber, a magic wand, or a vital part in their den. In the same way, the city is also open to the imagination, setting the scene for a whole raft of creativity, myths, and legends. We just need to give their bodies and minds access to it. Another vital component of a child's play is risk. The development of skills and confidence through risk taking and learning how to manage risks is a critical element of play. Lack of risk taking denies children the ability to learn from their mistakes and to judge risks effectively. A lack, a lack of good judgment can have serious consequences as a child gets older. But it is important that we differentiate good risks from hazards. Hazards are those that are difficult or impossible for children to assess for themselves and have no obvious benefits and may easily cause serious injury. Good risks in play provision are those that engage and challenge children that support their growth, learning and development. These might include equipment with moving parts, which offers opportunities for dynamic, physically challenging play, changes in height that give children the opportunity to overcome fears and feel a sense of satisfaction in climbing, and natural, loose materials that give children the chance to create and destroy constructions. Like imaginative potential, risks are many and wide-ranging and go far beyond what is on offer in the playground. Kids need exposure to a wide range of manageable risks in order to test themselves, heighten their awareness, and develop skills to overcome them. One of the great sources of evidence of this are nature play settings. Nature play settings offer significantly more play value and therapeutic benefit than the typical playground or classroom. And this is largely because they present them with so much to learn about the world, all of its wonders, its risks and its challenges. It also provides so much non-prescriptive content for them to explore their own world through their imagination, which really means they get to better understand themselves and have fun doing it. Although this one is in Japan, in Germany there are well over 700 of these forest nurseries in which children up to six years old spend half of each day outside in all weathers, playing, learning, building, exploring, climbing trees, getting dirty and close to nature, and generally forgoing the usual structured classroom environment. And research backs up the many claims that forest kindergartens are of great benefit to children. A study in 2002 found that in six different categories, from cognitive tasks to social behavior, to creativity and physical ability, children who attended these walled kindergartens clearly outperformed their peers at school. The children who spend more time outside playing, using their imagination, experiencing new things and overcoming risks and challenges are supercharging their social, emotional, cognitive and physical development, boosting their education, health, future prospects and contribution to society. And what's also important to remember is that the provision of play not only benefits children, but parents and whole communities. We believe that children being seen and heard in our shared public spaces is the hallmark of a vital community. That sufficient quality, accessible places to play can greatly influence how an area's inhabitants feel about their community and how safe they believe it to be. So if we look at this local example, uh, La Linea Verde uh, in Aguas Calientes, a project that was described as social acupuncture. It's claimed that in the year the park has been in operation, robberies and assaults have declined by more than 50% and the health outcomes in the community have greatly improved. Residents are more actively involved in social activity and now have opportunities for sport, recreation and leisure within pedestrian range of their homes. It's also worth noting the park is implemented in an area of high economic deprivation and that local property values have increased by as much as 20% since it opened. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean is Galax City. Galax City in the Adachi Ward of Tokyo is a children's function centre which contains a number of innovative play spaces and facilities to develop a child's physical, sensory, creative and spiritual capacities. Similar to La Linea Verde, the area has seen a reduced crime rate since its opening, so it too is predicted to boost the socio-economic status of the surrounding area. This is the, the transformative power of play.
Crisis for Play can also provide parental support. They can help reduce conflict and relieve stress levels inside the home by providing alternative places where children can spend their time. An interesting fact is that parents who spend less actual time with their children through working a full-time job or otherwise, in fact, spend more quality time with their children. Therefore, those fortunate kids have the added benefit of better parenting. So you can see that the benefits of play go far beyond the obvious. It's an essential part of every kid's life, molding them into functional, successful, and healthy adults. Play is proven to reduce stress, improve mental health, and physical health, reduce incidents of serious accident or injury, aid learning, foster community spirit, increase social and economic value, reduce antisocial behavior and crime, and promote creativity and innovation. It is a biological, psychological, and social necessity, and is fundamental to the health development and well-being of both individuals and communities. It really should be high on our list of priorities. So, Despite the boundless capacity for children to play, play is under threat in the contemporary world. There has been a contraction of the play realm and the loss of many streets and other locations as a place of play, and an increasing tendency for play to be restricted to designated places or the domestic realm. Over the past 40 to 50 years, we have seen a significant decline in children's free play. And this has had awful consequences. In 2011, research carried out by the British Medical Association found that 44% of English children are now what, not reaching what teachers consider to be an acceptable level of development by the age of five. That's the age that they would start school. In 2001, child psychologist Helena Bodrova repeated a study on self-regulation in children, first conducted in the 1940s. She said that today's five-year-olds were acting at the level of three-year-olds 60 years ago and seven-year-olds were barely approaching the level of a five-year-old 60 years ago. Her hypothesis being that children are experiencing greatly reduced opportunities for their free play. In 2008, a study compared the strength of 10-year-olds to children of the same age in 1998. They found that the number of sit-ups they could do had declined by 27.1%, while arm strength had fell by 26% and grip strength by 7%. Meanwhile, the number unable to hold their own body weight had doubled. In 2016, we found that myopia, or short-sightedness, is more than twice as pre prevalent among UK children now than in the 1960s, the same as the situation in the US. In China, as much as 90% of teenagers and young children are short-sighted, driven by spending too much time indoors, the prevalent use of computers and smartphones, and ever-increasing time spent reading and studying. We also know that obesity has doubled in children in the past 30 years, and mental health issues are becoming common again, common among young people. For several reasons, the opportunities for hugely beneficial, self-driven free play in our cities has greatly diminished, and the fear is that children will grow into a generation of dysfunctional adults. The table shown here is from Inspiring Scotland's Problem Tree for Play. This half highlights the effects of the barriers to play. And whilst the right to play is universal, not all children have equal opportunities to play. Research shows that for various reasons, children from poorer, back poorer families are worst affected. Those children from poorer backgrounds fare worse in every assessed category of development than those from wealthier backgrounds. And this is because cost is a major barrier to childcare play centres, educational activities, and generally play provision is of much poorer quality in low-income neighbourhoods. Further, parents find it difficult to find work or cannot continue to work due to difficulties of affording accessible childcare. And we call this the childcare trap. I'll repeat my earlier point. Poverty is a cycle that families struggle to get out of. Children from jobless families are growing up to become jobless themselves. There are serious concerns for the future health, prospects, education, educational attainment levels, and propensity to engage in antisocial and, and criminal behaviour. My point is that the responsibility for reducing the barriers to play has to extend beyond the dedicated play practitioners, childcare centres and parents. It's our belief that 
Those accountable for the design and regeneration of our everyday environments should also be responsible for upholding the rights of the child. Unfortunately, planners and designers generally don't understand play benefit or the rights of the child and don't seem to value the place in the city. Therefore, play provision is so often just a token gesture. A lack of high quality, safe, accessible provisions for children is a major barrier to their play. And coupled with rising fear, parental fears of traffic and or predators means that many parents feel the need to restrict children's opportunities to play outside. But none of these perceptions or fears cannot be remedied by good design. And by the way, it is a myth that there are pedos hiding in the bushes. It's an uncomfortable and contentious subject, but most sexual abuse of, of children occurs in a residence, typically that of the victim. And in 95% of cases, the perpetrator is known to the victim. Putting that aside. I recognize that many design professionals are already involved in enhancing the quality of play opportunities for children. However, we would contend that design professions have been unduly conservative in their approach, primarily concerned with improving specific products or config configurations of, spe of specific products and designated playgrounds. Although not belittling the innovations and good intentions of design professionals, design as a collective is not realizing its potential and is arguably perpetuating problems. Landscape architect um, Professor Helen Woolley of the University of Sheffield coined this term KFC playground. KFC being kit, fence, carpet, in reference to the few pieces of standard kit or play equipment, uh, perimeter fencing, originally meant to keep out dogs but now seems to keep in children, and carpet being the rubber safety surfacing. I would now like to address the problem of these and designated playgrounds in general. Restricting spaces that welcome children and other play opportunities just shoehorns children of all ages and social circles into very few spaces, resulting often in conflict and bullying. The, the diagram of a typical playground is, to me, akin to a fort, a defensible location. So the typical characteristics of isolation, having a barrier, occupiable structures, and clear lines of sight to permit territorial behavior and feelings of intimidation. A recent survey in Glasgow found that 23% of children and 29% of young people say they feel frightened in their parks. Standardized and regulated equipment fails to engage and provide adequate challenge, which has very limited developmental benefits to children and often results in limited use and invites misuse. I might add that the tasteless and unrelenting use of primary colors is extremely patronizing at best. Anyway, um, Haley Nebelong believes that this standardi standardization of play equipment is dangerous because they don't provide uh, adequate facility enough to prepare children for the treachery of life. Already limited budgets are often unnecessarily wasted on safety surfacing and fencing, which severely limits the potential play value of any project. So I've seen one stat that said as much as 40% of a budget is spent on safety. Typical playgrounds tend to have a repetitive and limited range of affordances, utilizing similar types of equipment and slightly differing arrangements. Children very quickly learn to master these play types and inevitably get bored. And lastly, designated play areas don't offer spontaneous incidental play. The playground itself is a folly, a, a token gesture. Play is freewheeling, spontaneous and incidental, whereas a playground is a destination or a scheduled event, much like you or I might go to the gym. Ultimately, the model is flawed. There is a need for holistic design solutions that look not only within, but between and beyond what is currently acknowledged or zoned as places for play. For now, there is still an issue of quality, quantity, diversity, and interconnectivity, of accessibility and affordances. In short, designers need to design more playful and playful places. 
So a child-friendly city in the context of life between buildings is one that encourages active and passive engagement with the built and natural environment, uh, local culture, community and heritage. The physical design of a city dictates this and its accessibility to affordances that satisfy children's innate desire to play, to explore and to discover. If a play space is, can be identified as a place with a variety of natural and man-made items, with different structures, textures and smells to be explored, then can't most public spaces be defined as such? Of course they can, because children respond, uh, respond objectively and subjectively to their environment, interpreting it in their own way for their own reasons. Any space, in any location, in, on, around, or any, any object or objects can be given meaning, if only temporarily through play. And given meaning, it becomes a place, no longer a void or a vacuum, it's a place of play. Not necessarily for play, but playable nonetheless. So while a play playground is a place of play, a place of play is not a playground. Play cannot be confined to the playground. Play cannot be confined to a limited set of affordance, locations with a limited set of affordances. And this is what we have to be mindful of as designers. Given that access to play is a universal right, quality play and learning experiences are as valuable a commodity as education or homes. So we must consider the city as a place of play and what that entails. So the next two slides is, is my, my guidance on that. We must look to provide a broad spectrum of play experiences, welcoming, welcoming children and making allowances for their activity in a great number and range of places. Our everyday and public spaces should embrace children and not temper their natural curiosity and desires to play. We cannot be content with a, a one-size-fits-all playground model, but we must also consider dedicated playgrounds as just one part of a network of locations inviting play. Considering spontaneous and incidental play, diversity and experience, inclusivity and contextual harmony. Edinburgh's Play Area Action Plan states that children choose to play in a variety of wild and semi-wild places, such as pocket parks, green verges, school grounds, country parks, woods, riversides, streams, canals, beaches and coasts. While this is great, it suggests mainly natural environments, I would contend that in a modern world, children should play in and experience both natural and man-made environments. In Amsterdam, we experienced a great variety of playable spaces that squeezed play value into the cracks of this very dense city and exemplified what can be achieved when space is at a premium. We identified at least eight play space typologies, including dedicated play streets, that excluded cars and made provisions for children right on their doorstep. Corner infills that repurpose vacant building plots for young children. Multifunctional civic spaces that legitimize children's play. So this is a, a market square, but it also has a permanent set of football goalposts, some play equipment and a water rill providing dedicated provisions for play, but within a wider area of multiple use. And they also have both formal and informal natural playscapes, which in most scenarios embrace the country's unique geography, incorporating waterways as a primary feature. I also think that rightfully, we should be looking to allow children and adults to adapt and if only temporarily adopt a variety of locations, particularly underutilized spaces therein inspiring a sense of fun, exploration, creativity, spontaneous social interaction and connection with place. The redesigned Piazza Risorgimento in Bari is a good example. With its swiveling benches, it's a public space that is not totally predefined and allows users a certain level of autonomy in arranging it as they please. Such novelty creates a meaningful and memorable engagement with the space and can prompt social interaction between strangers. Whereas children spend a lot of their time exploring its affordance for play and being creative while looking to challenge themselves or their friends. In Scotland, we have a, a scheme just now which is managed by Architecture and Design Scotland called Stalled Spaces. 
Stall spaces help support and fund temporary community projects that make use of underused and temporarily available locations such as brownfield sites like this one. One such project that we've been fortunate to be involved in is the Pollock Shields Playhouse. The Playhouse is a, a temporary community space that has been utilising a derelict plot for over a year while it awaits development. It was envisioned as a, a place for local people to make their ideas happen and included a, a diverse range of program, a diverse program of events. Sorry. In July this year, we hosted an event here called Tinker Town, which advocated our philosophy regarding children in the city. In simple terms, it was a den building event, allowing kids the opportunity to and experience of using tools such as hammers and saws and recycled materials such as wooden pallets to build their own structures. But for three weeks or so, this was a place outside of their homes that they could take ownership of and define its content and use. It was a place where they were free to use their imagination, take risks, test themselves, learn new skills, negotiate and collaborate with others, and forgo the unnecessary restraints placed upon them by a risk-averse society. That's my wee girl. <laughs> this is literally a building site. It's not a playground. And in some ways, it's about giving kids space skills in construction trades, architecture, and even urban design. Without stall spaces allowing us to access and utilize these sites, kids cannot benefit from this kind of experience. So maybe this should be my point 1.1, 1 .1, make space available for kids to use. We must consider and make provisions for the independent movement of children and young people, allowing them to access these opportunities. Much greater recognition is needed of the role of walking and cycling, both as a means to improve access to play opportunities and as forms of play experience in their own right. I'd like to draw your attention to this conceptual framework for child friendliness, which was developed by Marketa Kaita. It provides a very helpful tool for play advocacy it's based on Gibson's work on affordances and the role of children's independent mobility in actualizing those affordances. It characterizes child friendliness in terms of, on the one hand, experiences on offer in a neighborhood and on the other, children's ability to access those experiences. So the more affordances we make for play and the more independent movement or access to those affordances is supported, the more child friendly a city can be. Um, recently, I heard Spanish architect Inara Sagana speak about this wonderful notion that of children's transitions from home to the city, particularly in concern of collective housing developments. She spoke about how the first step from the domestic realm is often play in the common spaces between apartments. Then, as they get older and more independent, their presence should be encouraged by design in the shared spaces between their blocks and then on the periphery of the estate and so on. So there is this incremental progress supporting the child's individual and natural development and legitimizing their use of the space by permitting their everyday freedom and transition to the city. Unfortunately, I don't have her case study, but I think this notion is also evident in our experiences of the playability of the Netherlands with play on the doorsteps in the streets and other shared spaces. When um, the new town of Cumbernauld in Scotland was built, it had a series of pedestrian walkways that led to the town centre without crossing any of the roads. Um, these routes connected a series of pocket parks and many play areas, as well as shared spaces, surfaces and cobbles of dirt that would serve as an informal place to play. Unfortunately, due to a lack of maintenance, most of these spaces don't exist anymore. In Holland, they've implemented a, a comprehensive cycle network across the whole country where children learn to ride a bike, to navigate their cities and negotiate traffic from a very young age. As much as 27% of all journeys in the country are made by bike and 60% in Amsterdam city centre. This allows children to access the city's vast array of play and green spaces, engage in incidental social interactions and boost their health happiness and fitness. And in this, there's also been a lot of work, both in design and policy, to allay the safety fears of parents. In fact, it was our conclusion upon studying Amsterdam that a truly cycle-friendly city is also a child-friendly city. We must understand that play is exploratory and pushes boundaries. 
which can inevitably lead to conflict through perceived misuse of objects not initially intended for their play. If play is to be embraced in public spaces, they must make provisions that can withstand their raucous activity. We can't and therefore shouldn't look to eliminate this appropriation of other everyday objects and spaces, but aim to try and reduce this conflict. So if we do not provide an abundance of places in which to play, children will instinctively appropriate what is there. This is where their presence is going to be challenged by older members of the community or their parents themselves, leading to their outdoor play being stigmatized and prohibited. Aldo Van Eyck felt that the city should provide an extremely dense network of places that children can adopt, even creating a fine network of simply designed sing single play apparatus that could be adapted by adults for other purposes when children weren't present. Whereas Richard Dantner suggested that we accept and adapt the features and furniture of the street to be play provisions, offering, for example, that lamp posts could support basketball hoops or volleyball, net or volleyball nets. He said that the construction of the sidewalk and its ancillary utilities represents a large capital outlay and to use the space fully is economical rather than the reverse. Whether it's this approach or not, the point is, is not just to make affordances for, for play, but to notify adults that children's play is a legitimate use of the space. We should take an approach of equitable, equitable development to avoid either a case of gentrification through play or widening the attainment gap between higher and lower income neighborhoods. The right to play is a unit is an equal right and as such we must create equal opportunities and greater opportunities for all children and young people not just in fixed play equipment but in access to sports childcare, play centers and other luxuries such as quality green space cultural and art centers something that i feel we've been getting right in scotland is that every child between three and four and some two and five year olds are entitled to 600 hours of free early learning and childcare per year now this takes a massive strain off of parents and it's probably the biggest step in the country's goal to be the best place to grow up. When planning and designing for play, we might consider where concentrations of human activity are going to be. An isolated children's play area is not accessible, particularly to younger children, and is vulnerable to antisocial behaviour. The most successful and popular play spaces are programmed in or around a wider hub of activity because these are safer and more convenient for families in a busy schedule. In Amsterdam, we noticed that the adults' needs, shops, cafes, community centres, places to sit, exercise equipment and even classes are often programmed either in or around the play areas. The obvious benefits of this are twofold. Play becomes convenient for the carers and therefore more accessible for children and parents can more easily adopt the mantra of Tom Hodgkinson's idle parent, whereby children are free to dictate their own play without oppression or direction. In London, my friends at Pop-Up Parks have also realized this need, and they use a, a set kit of parks to rapidly transform and repurpose public spaces. Now, these are obviously temporary interventions, but they are test studies, and their aspiration is to explore ways of permanently transforming the built environment to bring about lasting change. I've recently become, been impressed by this new affordable housing complex in Ljubljana in Slovenia, where play is integrated into the roots and to topography and humane and generous landscaping, benches, trees, bin stores are all designed and positioned with thought and creativity. I was particularly struck by the quantity of early years play spaces. Within a small development, there are at least seven of these many play spaces, which have used off the shelf equipment, but at least they exist. And they are positioned between the blocks so that they are visible and overlooked. They are easily accessible for younger children and are protected from damage by older teenagers. There's also a games court which is located in an elevated position on the periphery of the development. Again, it's quite standard fare, but it's sensibly placed so that residents aren't affected by noise and is distinct and separate from the early years play. What was also of note here is that the housing is still being built but someone had the common sense to implement the core landscaping, infrastructure and amenity spaces before building all the houses so that the area still feels connected and livable. You should always expect more for your money. 
we should always seek to be creative, sustainable, and cost and sorry, always seek to use a creative, sustainable, and cost efficient use of resources to stretch our already limited budgets and increase play value. Poor design and planning has failed to yield enough benefit uh, to warrant significant investment up until now. Creativity and consideration of design and cost efficient use of resources could bring greater benefit and warrant a much greater warrant increased financial backing. So utilizing recycled materials can represent a significant saving and provide novel experiences. Well, in some cases, this can open up a project to corporate sponsorship. So for example, we made material cost savings here of a few thousand pounds, exploiting the corporate social responsibility of a company who gifted, uh, gifted us a dozen cable reels that were due to be incinerated. And this was for just one mention on social media. This isn't finished, by the way. <laughs> We've also used the likes of the local community payback team who lead um, offenders set into the community service as manual labor in clearance and preparation of our site. And speaking of site clearance, with some foresight, it could prove econo economical and sustainable to prepare for play at a preliminary stage. So the sourcing of resources from sites such as rocks and fell trees for play structures and earth and rubble to form mounds and, play and, mounds and landforms can make significant cost savings to be turned into play value, increasing diversity in play and learning environments. Um, my last point is in regards to children and young people's par participation in the redevelopment of their city. Where possible, we should look to engage children in the planning and design of their public and play spaces. Although I learned recently this can mean very different things in different contexts. In any case, this is about engendering a sense of autonomy and feelings of ownership and a duty of care for the, pro for the new environment. Um, Doug Reagan, who's the chief of Chief UN Habitat Youth and Livelihood Unit, told me that in African slums, this meant championing youth-led groups to clear tons of waste and rubbish in public spaces to reveal and create new community spaces for events, sports, and play. In more developed countries, we are working in much less alarming scenarios, but they are nonetheless important. Some, particularly play workers, become self-titled play designers, often take an approach of co-design, but this brings issues in managing children's expectation and often conflict with the architect as a, a problem solver, a proud artist and a master of design. Instead, what we focus on is spending the time to understand their likes and dislikes in regards to their sensory and emotional experiences, as well as their physical and mental activity. The focus being purely on experience and affordances of a new environment and then laterally gaining the feedback on the designs. And this can be applied to consultations and planning and in the design of a new play space. So here, PhD researcher and our newest team member, Jenny Wood, worked with children to map their local area, allowing them to identify, what is identify to us what's important to them. She was able to then use this to construct a child-centric version of the area and compare it with the adult planner-centric view. Um, before I finish, I'd like to leave you with some comments from a 12-year-old Adora Svitak in her TED talk titled, What Adults Can Learn From Kids. The goal is not to turn kids into your kind of adult, but rather better adults than you have been. No matter your position or place in life, it is imperative to create opportunities for children so that they can grow up to blow you away. And in case you don't think this has a meaning for you, remember that cloning is possible. And that means going through childhood all over again. Whenever we talk about children, we can never avoid the old cliche that they are the future. Because it's true and it matters. When I was expecting my first child, I was really nervous. But someone said to me then, a baby is never a burden but a blessing. And I don't think that changes from baby and parent to children and society. If you invest everything in your children, you're rewarded every day, and eventually you begin to see a, a better version of yourself. The same applies to the city. Investment in childhood is an investment indeed. Children have a right to the city, and the city has a right to children. Thank you.
Thank you, Grant. Eh, continuamos en unos minutos con la conferencia de Nadine Malev, directora, del, directora ejecutiva del Instituto para la Arquitectura Pública de Nueva York. Les recordamos que la siguiente conferencia será también en inglés y que a mi derecha tienen los traductores, en caso de que los necesiten con una identificación, le, se los pueden entregar. Denos un par de minutos para darle la bienvenida a Nadine Malev. <risa> 